Okay. Um, I, my name is Wayne Keen, and the reason I wanted to do this question and answer session with Leander Gridley on our left and John Olson on our right is that um, I have felt that they haven't received the appropriate credit for their contributions over 30 and 40 years of archaeo-replication. Especially monetary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, I kind of want to set this right, maybe not the financial aspect. But, um, Put out your hat. <laughs> and, and what I would say about Leander and John is they're both soft-spoken gentlemen of many talents, um, not just pottery. I mean, Leander's um, a horse expert and has rebuilt this old house to this absolutely beautiful place in Mancus. And John, I think, can drive a bulldozer and a road grader and a backhoe. Um, he built this incredibly beautiful home himself. Um, in Boulder, Utah, in the most unbelievably beautiful setting. Uh, he can kind of fix everything. Um, and they aren't the kind of people that are inclined to wave their hands and say, look at me, look at me. Um, and um, I want to, um, I'm, I'm going to ask them some questions, and then we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, I was going to say that the idea of sitting in front of a large group of people is probably about as appealing to them as having a colonoscopy by a badger. Could we be more specific? <laughs> I, I want them to be, be relaxed and, and know that they're among friends. Um, I met Leander and John both through pottery, and I think that Leander came to a kiln conference we had on my farm, I don't know, 17 years ago out in Yellow Jacket, Colorado. And I think I met John when we had the kiln conference in Boulder, Utah, at the Anasazi Center. And, um, and so, John, I think you're the earliest RPO replicator uh, here. And um, you told me that you were hauling horses on a deer hunt and nearly slid off an embankment in the clay. And you realized it was clay. And, um, and it, as I remember, you studied ceramics in college. And so what I would like to have you start with is how you got interested in pottery. And i kind of like to know kind of where you were 40 years ago and 30 years ago and 20 years ago and 10 years ago and where you are now. Um, and, um, and, and also how you met Leander, because you, the two of you have been friends. And what I know is that you have such respect for each other. Um, and sort of how you guys met. So we'll start with you, John. Well, I guess I got into pottery pretty early on. Um, my folks lived in Southern California, and they were, uh, so my dad was in the military and went into kind of civilian military building, X-15, B-70, and things like that. We lived in the Antelope Valley in, in Southern California, which is, was pretty remote. But we moved to Utah in like 1969, and my interest, we uh, kind of took care of an orchard. And I remember walking the ditches after we irrigate, finding pottery pieces, arrowheads, and things like that. And that's that's where my interest began. So, and in the in the high school, um, finding clay, throwing it on the wheel, making my teacher super nervous, firing it in a kiln because he thought it was going to melt and destroy everything. Uh, that's kind of where it began. Probably by the late 70s, I was 
I'd went through college and studied ceramics. And my professor encouraged us to find native clays, messing around. And so I was doing polychromes and, and uh, redwares back in '73 and '74, and uh, it was I was polishing them with a stone. And we were still firing in the kiln, so I I, I kind of experimented with a little bit of outdoor firing and with no success. That came later. But after college, I just kind of you know, got involved with work. And so I dip into it every once in a while. And by the mid 80s, I was full blown recreating stuff. By the end of the, end of the 80s, I was really interested in corrugated and got uh, involved with that. I did some in college a little bit. But Totally different than what we see here. And just kind of progressed over the years. I kind of retired from pottery seven or eight years ago. I don't sell much anymore. <clears throat> I just recreate stuff. I give away more than I sell. And it's uh, my interest right now is corrugated, um, all the different styles. Today. But I still I still delve into uh, black and white with organic paints and some mineral, but we can just organics. Some red wares, not much. Thanks, John. And and let me just mention that <clears throat> you'll be sitting with John talking and he'll be corrugating, and an hour later he's corrugated this spectacular oil this skin. And he, one time I brought him some Hopi clay, I think two years ago, and he corrugated it and I fired it in sheep dung and it fired yellow with the orange blush. And I think it's the most beautiful corrugated piece I've ever seen. Um, and it has a place of honor in my home. Um, so Leander, let me come to you and um, sort of, Tell us about your job. Except I didn't use local clay. I grew up in Wisconsin. Um, became enamored with the potter's wheel when I was in sixth grade. Uh, found out I could make a real mess in an art class and play around and get a passing grade. <laughs> and uh, threw on the potter's wheel, learned on one of those stand up aluminum kick wheels with the treadle uh, uh, bar on it and uh, through for uh, all through my years in, in uh, high school and went to, uh, had, everything was kiln fired and I uh, never had a thought for pit firing or the ancient stuff that uh, is, was everywhere in the, in the Midwest. And, and other areas, not as visible as it is in this part of the world. Um, went to uh, uh, Fort Lewis College in uh, 1969. That's where I met my current wife. Um, we dated a little bit, but split up for 20 years. Um, and uh, came back to um, art classes and that was my real focus, much to my parents' chagrin, uh, to uh, uh, to make pottery and to do artwork, artwork in quotes, um, and was really enamored with uh, what people were doing like Peter Volkus um, and uh, some of the other uh, modern day potters to see how much clay you could throw on the potter's wheel. And I never got to where I could um, get much more than 25 pounds centered um, and to make a large piece of pottery and never realized what kind of um, feeling you can get from the clay work by um, hand built. And everything that was hand built back in that, those days was, you know, roll slabs out and glue them together and make something and never realized the kind of things that primitive people had made in the past. Uh, became uh, 
enamored with that until I uh, graduated. <clears throat> they kicked me out, basically. They gave me a diploma and said, that's it. And, <laughs> and uh, did a lot of things, carpentry. Uh, I worked on a ranch for a while um, and uh, found, uh, just but the year before I uh, graduated, found uh, Hal Rieger's book on primitive pottery. And uh, one of the earliest uh, picture books on, on making primitive pottery and, and hand digging clay and, and then uh, clay and glazes for the potter, which Daniel Rhodes re-published uh, uh, in 1973. And Hal Rieger's book really kind of bent my head about hand building and about uh, firing in a, a natural way. Everything except for his tire firings, where he put tires around a pot and then light them on fire. Uh, which wouldn't be politically correct nowadays. But uh, uh, in 1977, um, when I was working on this ranch, um, making just a couple hundred dollars a, a month and all I could eat, um, I received an offer to become artist in residence in uh, Cortez, Colorado, through a Colorado Council of Arts and Humanities program. And that's what brought me from the Tall Pines uh, northeast of uh, Durango to uh, Cortez. And uh, from living with uh, no running water and an outhouse and electricity and a wood stove uh, to uh, an actual little home on an alley behind the uh, um, city building in, in Cortez. Subsequently, it's been mowed down. But uh, uh, it was really kind of a shock to move from the woods to being in public and teaching uh, artwork, in quotes, um, and uh, got on, on to my uh, potter's wheel again, and my leader, Dwayne Longenbaugh, who was the city uh, manager at the time, said, oh, you should make some of those Anasazi pots. And I thought, well, sure, no sweat. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and that began my, my trials and tribulations of the uh, uh, primitive world and actually, you know, realizing uh, what had been done in the past in this part of the world. And what an honor we all owe to these primitive people for the artwork that they had created over eight or 900 years. Uh, and it became a, a real challenge to try to replicate those uh, objects, uh, designs and things. Beeweed was beyond my capacity. So I was using Duncan uh, Underglaze 012 which makes a pretty good fake, and you can burnish it into the, into the surface of the vessel, and, uh, and it looks um, similar. Um, and it took me a while to, to uh, uh, get past that and, and get on to actual um, yucca brushes, like some of you guys tried the other day, which are just beautiful and, and hard to replicate um, with, a, with a standard uh, commercial brush. but. Uh, and then in 1980, uh, I was living in McElmo Canyon and uh, had been down there for a few years and Kelly Place opened up. George Kelly was a uh, horticulturist who had a place in Littleton called The Green Spot for you people that had been in Denver for very long. And he uh, moved to McElmo Canyon uh, to grow grapes, uh, apple trees, uh, pear, peach, Etc. just because of the climate in McElmo <clears throat> and had irrigation and became enamored with the uh, uh, ancestral dwellings and remains on his property and amassed quite a collection, not necessarily all um, in a good way, but uh, uh, he dug a lot of holes on that property and, and was very careful in his uh, excavation and, and uh, <clears throat> collection of his work 
and Rodney and Christy Carricker bought that property from George because he was in his, his second retirement and they wanted to start doing um, pottery workshops and that's what we when we started down there a couple of years after they opened up we started the Sand Canyon uh, pottery workshop. And what year was that? I'm thinking it was 82 or 83 but we were doing programs with with kids um, for for those periods of times and I I really didn't have a, a, a clue at all about a lot of the things that I was doing although I could fake it pretty well and uh, we used every sticky substance known to uh, man in that part of the uh, country uh, the green clay that you see around here works very well um, if you can get it in a in a good spot uh, the brown clay makes a fair uh, paint slip um, the uh, shale clays that uh, um, we we find around Cortez and the, that uh, over the when, when I first was in Cortez they had opened up the industrial park which uh, plowed open a lot of areas of the ground that uh, exposed that uh, what you guys call industrial park gray and it's it's that great um, plastic white firing stuff we didn't do too much in terms of specific tempers. We'd get sand out of the wash and add it to the clay to have a little bit of tooth to it. And we would burn things up in a big bonfire. And then when John and I got together doing stuff down there, we made some massive fires. And <laughs> uh, probably wasted a lot of wood. But uh, we made some hard pots. And uh, John's the one that taught me how to really turn a corrugated pot. And I'll tell you, once you learn how to do that, it's kind of a capturing uh, feel for, for doing that. And you guys that like clay, there's just nothing quite as neat as that feeling that you get when you can um, create something that comes out of the earth in a, a formless mass and create an object and the different stages of of the hardness that happened with the with the clay is was way beyond my understanding when i was throwing on the potter's wheel i would heard about people throwing on the potter's wheel and letting it stiffen up and adding coils so you can could raise it and make it a into a larger vessel and never had that capacity but uh, hand building is kind of like slow motion throwing and it uh, uh, allows you to feel the clay through those different stages of, of softness and bonding things together and then once you complete that shape when it begins to solidify and it, you get that vibration that happens just before it's dried out and uh, it's magic. And then you sacrifice it in the fire, and hopefully you end up with something. So that's my story. Leander, let me ask you, how many firings, how many outdoor firings do you think you've done? Oh, my. Just ask her to guess. Oh, boy. That's a hard one. Uh, well, with kids' groups, I know we do uh, a couple dozen uh down at Kelly Place, kids groups and elder hostel and uh, elder hostel and their grandchildren. So we do uh, a dozen firings just there, and then I probably do another five or six on my own. So I don't know. I never have counted. I'm terrible at record keeping. Me too. Uh, <laughs> Charlene has got record keeping down to the <laughs> degree and teaching me some, but uh, um, I. Do make a lot of notes and you guys know that like clay it's kind of a contemplative deal and you get i don't know it gets puts you into a spiritual realm that's uh, uh kind of hard to replicate with any other kind of uh, artwork uh, just because of that the touchy feelingness of it and the, the mind-centeredness of it uh, any of you who've read uh 
Mary Carolyn uh, Richards' book, uh, Centering, uh, no, and she's kind of over the top with uh, the spiritual aspect of things, but uh, um, it's very mind-consuming and, uh, and a, a fascinating, almost meditative kind of thing that happens. And I used to try to start out with an idea in mind when I was creating a pot, and I found that if I would just shut up and let it pot, let the pot do its thing, it'll create yes. itself. And, um, and I, I just love that aspect of the, of the work. It's fun to replicate. I love trying to create another artist's work, but not, that's not necessarily where my being is, but I do really enjoy doing that. And one of my, one of my aha moments was, <clears throat> I used to see a design I wanted to paint on a pot, and then I would try and reproduce that shape and I rarely was successful. And it seemed like a lot of times the design didn't fit right. And I read this thing by a Pueblo potter that said, play has a spirit, as is everything in the universe that's imbued with that spirit. And that you kind of have to let the clay go where it wants to go. So I made these four little oyas, and then found designs that fit that shape and it transformed my pottery. It was like like that. And um, and John, so um, just to ask you, I, you know, ballpark figure, how many firings? <laughs> I mean, I bet it's 500 or something. I guess you gotta go for 40 years times 10? <laughs> yeah. 10 years? Yeah, yeah. So 400. Yeah, so, you know, John, can you tell me about any aha moments that you had um, with, not with the wheel work and the high fire stuff, but with the archaeo replication? That's a tough one. I don't, the corrugated was, was absolutely maddening at first. And I spent hours in the museum here, actually. I was working here in town. Whenever I had any spare moment, I'd come and go to the back room, look at corrugated shirts, and drive myself crazy. And then <clears throat> go home on weekends, it took me 10 hours to get home, and start just as soon as I get home, and leave at 2 in the morning, get back to work Sunday night, doing fire. So, and, and it was like, all of a sudden it just clicked. It's like, this is the easiest thing in the world. Why work so hard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a. It, I, I think the problem is, is we are so stuck in modern ceramics like scoring and slipping and, and things like that that we didn't, we don't understand that they didn't do any of that. Mm -hmm. they, that it was. And if you were look at a corrugated broken piece, you can see the shingling in there, and that's that was the key that it pointed. Uh, was Dwayne stopped for having illegally taking pottery in our home? What's that? If you could share that with us. Dwayne Stout? No, you get it stopped. Oh, having... getting oh, yes. stopped. Yes. So, yeah, I do all kinds of replica work. So I was, this is, has nothing to do with pottery. <laughs> and, uh, out gathering some really nice nappable stone out of the Chinle Formation, just in, uh, south of Zion National Park. And I was out of the park. And uh, I thought, well, I'm not going to let nobody see my car. And I pulled off the side of the road. Of course, my my car was full of all kinds of artifacts. Like I had uh, cots that I'd made, and John arrowheads. <laughs> John effects, John effects. Yeah, and, and, and uh, I went up in the hills, and in the Chinle Formation, there was this nice uh, Shirt that comes out of the top between the red and the purple. And uh, I thought, oh, it's time for me to go. I gotta go pick up my daughter from school. So I just ducked into one of those deep gullies that wash in and walked out. Little did I know I was being snuck up uh, by BLM agents and uh, Park Service people. <laughs> Two agencies. <laughs> so I get back to my car 
<clears throat> and there's one guy there, like five or six outfits there. And uh, this guy looks up and he sees me. And I'm like, I wonder what's going on here. And I put the rocks in my car. And he come over and says, he's all nervous. He says, everything's okay. And uh, it's just it's a routine stop. And uh, just, just hang on for a minute. And I looked back up where I'd come from about a little over a quarter mile. There was people running down the ridge. <laughs> <laughs> they had camouflage gear on and riot shotguns. <laughs> so I spent probably three to four hours. They tore my car completely apart. And the only thing that saved me, and I'm sure you people have seen it, is in the chapel collection, there's a sunflower ball. And they have it on a postcard. And I had that postcard in my car. I had the bowl that I'd replicated in the back seat. And I said, really, do you think I went up in the hills with this postcard saying, I want to dig up this <laughs> Finally, it clicked on it, and they just left. Oh, I never heard that story. That's incredible. <laughs> they just came upon your car. And so I just loaded to the hills. I had there. hammer stones in there, brought there. Big corrugated pots. Yeah, and the axes and the saddles. <laughs> My car's usually a mess with all that stuff. <laughs> they thought he was a baby when he went down into the camp. Well, what was interesting about it is I had pictures in there. And that's the only thing they confiscated. I had yeah. pictures from the uh, uh, Glen Canyon NRA, and I was doing some uh, replica work for them. Bullfrog. So I was replicating their pots and points and stuff like that. And they sent me all the pictures and this is what we want. Blah, blah, blah. That's the only thing they confiscated. <laughs> Took me like a month to get him back. But you told them to call them, right? Did they call yeah, them they called the uh, Anasazi State Park. I think they called here. A bunch of different places where right? I So that's got to be the highest honor. <laughs> <laughs> Park Service and BLM think that they were real. Yeah, was, actually, they had a, a undercover agent there. She had Colorado license plates. And she was uh, the under, uh, undercover agent for all of the, that whole area. So when, when question I had, and I've asked both of you this about who, who found the Mount Marilla night. And um, yeah, the Cannonball White. And Paul Ermagotti thought Clint Swink found it, and Eric Blinman both thought that Clint Swink had found it. Um, and I haven't found anyone that had a different opinion. From that. All I know is Leander took me out there one time, and I think Bob Casillas was with us, and we rode, rode up at that road. That's the first time I've been there in the last time. Uh -huh. And so I had heard a that story. Had been, what, 92 or 3? Um, maybe earlier than that. I had heard a story, and I had, honestly, I wish I could remember where I heard it, was that when the earliest settlers came to McElmo Canyon, that um, they found where someone had dug into the Mount Marillonite under a rock, and so there was a little alcove here. And there were some uh, ancestral Pueblo and baskets with Mount Marilla and I. And, and I don't know if that story is true. It sure might have pointed to somebody thinking, hmm, I wonder what this was used for. Um, and one thing I, I had called yeah, the real anomaly in the, in the area. I mean, there's nothing like it. And so. And you know, we were talking about this the other day. There could be over on the other side of the canyon, over on the Ute side, but we will probably never know. And you know, Eric Blinman made the comment that um, to me last week in an email discussion that there's 20,000 ancestral potters making black on white in the San Juan Basin, and they had to be getting it from somewhere other than that little resource, and um, and I think that's a salient observation. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about, um, you know, my mentor was Rick St. John, who was, you know, formally, he had a dual master's degree in 
ceramic engineering and ceramic art. And he was telling me that, um, and we all know this, that you see those prehistoric Mesa Verde black and white shirts, and they're fired hard. You know, and he said, so there's primary vitrification where under electron microscopy you start to see glass formation on the clay platelets. And secondary vitrification where the particles start to fuse together. And then third degree vitrification is where you get something like porcelain, which is glass, glass formation. And he said that as a general rule with those clays that they were using in the Mesa Verde region, um, that secondary vitrification occurs at 1,750 degrees Fahrenheit or 950 centigrade if you want to talk Euro trash. And, uh, and so <laughs> I have two science degrees. I'm pretty familiar with centigrade and so on. But, um, and so what he said was that he was like a resident scholar, or I don't remember his title, at like Crow Canyon. And then what he said was it was obvious that there was secondary vitrification. And that a, at some point when he was there, there had been a kiln excavated in northern New Mexico, and it could have been the La Pata area, I'm not sure. <clears throat> but they had had a torrential downpour. Um, right when they first started firing, and it extinguished the fire, and that it was cribbed around. And you know, Rick's point to me was, you got to have fuel and you got to have air. And he said that what happened when he built a cribbing around a kiln, and with sandstone slabs that were angled that he said you could stand by the kiln and feel the air coming in. And, and it was like this huge towering flame. And they hit um, 1750 by cone, and Rick was a fanatic about cones. He's like, pyrometers aren't the same as the working temperature of the clay. And so, um, do you, John, you told me once that um, you guys hit, what? 1940, Don Montoya was there. 1900. I his pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so uh, I, I want to ask you about this notion of, of getting air to the fire. And, and the other thing St. John said was that they got they got black out and white without smothering. Um, and any note, any thoughts about the from either of you about cribbing and how you get temperature? I have got it both ways. So when I first started, I didn't do trench kilns. I didn't start trench killing until probably the late eighties. But before that, I was all open fires, and uh, and a lot of it was pulled wood away at the right time else cover it with a bunch of ash before it, or just bring the temperature so hot that it, it, it goes beyond and it won't, it won't oxidize if you get a super super high temperature that's my experience that's the voice of the experience Wait, i need to hear that part again would you say that could we hear that again i don't know if i understood everything you said so if, if you if you get it so hot it won't oxidize if you get up around 1900 degrees. Yeah. And that kind of verifies or validates Charlene's yeah, observation. He said. That we're, you almost like yeah. get like glaze formation. Um, I seal the surface. Yeah. yeah. I've melted a pot to fly as a pancake. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, and I, I heard people talk about the prehistoric pots warping and drying, and that's why they were finding these warped pots. And I'm like, no, 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 no. They were getting temperatures that warped them. Um, and Leander, you have any thoughts about Just getting temperature? My whole idea was to get it as hot as possible. And just once in a while, I lucked out and got a really good uh, 
black on white or got a really good background white on top. Um, you guys know more about all this stuff than I do now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been, uh, but that's not been enlightening. And really, I, I used to be enamored with Tonto Polychrome and Salado and stuff like that. So I was firing super hot and then pulling the wood away. Just uh -huh. letting it like stopping it immediately so it didn't have that time to oxidize. And well, it oxidized, you know, but it didn't have that time to burn out that beat. What was the clue to pull the wood away? Was there a how did you know that? Well impatience. <laughs> like I wanted to get my pot done and it's like pull the wood away and get so I can get it home. <laughs> Possibly, I mean, I did that a lot. We were, they were talking about the uh, today about they've not found any kilns with uh, charcoal in them, and we just did a kiln a trench firing last week. And Jake can attest to that. We uh, buried it and came back the next morning, pulled all the pots out, and it reignited and burned everything. There was nothing left. Wow. We didn't have to clean it up or anything. It's interesting. So I'm going to open it up to, that's kind of all the questions I had, and I'd like to open it up to the audience. So the one thing I would ask is that if you ask a question, if you'd identify yourself, because Andy's videotaping it, and my notion is to transcribe this mm -hmm. and then submit it to Pottery Southwest, the online journal at UNM for publication. So if you would identify yourself, then I'll put your name in as the question. So, okay. In the end, or when you said, I was just trying to get it as hot as possible, can, can you give us some clues as to what you did in regards to maybe the wind flow and stuff like that to try to keep bumping that temperature? Um, smaller wood and more of an open crib when it was stacked. Um, when I first started uh, firing, or many of my first firings were with uh, cow dung, like Maria. <clears throat> and she has great video out. She's since passed a long time ago. But uh, she uh, used cow chips. And when I lived in McElmo, I had uh, the dung fields all around me. And we'd go out and, and gather up these dry chips. And one of the beautiful things about uh, those dark chips is they, they will totally burn with good heat and hold their shape. So it's a great insulator uh, for, uh, for the firing. Uh, not necessarily something those Pueblo ones would have been able to do. But cottonwood bark, and we talked about that. And Paul and I were talking about that earlier. And cottonwood uh, makes a lot of ash, um, and it would be, if you got enough shrubbery on top of that really, really hot fire, you could create enough ash to create a layer that you wouldn't have to use dirt to smother. And dirt to smother, it's a great way to go, but, you know, it's hard to make a shovel out of a scapula. So. <laughs> and John, you mentioned to me that at your last firing, you guys were using a mix of cottonwood and aspen, is that right? Or was it? Yeah. Yeah. So tell things. me about that. It's, it's, it, cottonwood and aspen fire pretty hard. Um, pretty, pretty hot. Um, we used probably arm size for most of our wood. And for our spanners, we used maybe six inches around. Um, interesting thing about cottonwood is it does burn in really hot. Uh, and and I've, I've experienced uh, certain clays work better with cottonwood than they do with uh, juniper. Um, I have a clay that it goes just a brilliant white. I, did, I do have a bowl, I didn't bring it, and it was fired with cottonwood. The only thing I don't like about cottonwood, and I think maybe somebody could do some research on it, is every once in a while, on your pot, you'll get a green, like glazy um, concretion on it. It sounds off easy, but you know, I, I would just 
wonder if some of the prehistoric stuff has it. Uh, I know down south, um, you know, probably juniper wasn't that plentiful. You'd have to call it one way, so the next best thing would be cottonwood. Although I did hear that cottonwood didn't come into this country until about last week or two years Maybe aspen. Um, wood makes a big difference for me. I like a mix of a little bit of cedar and a little bit of juniper and some cottonwood or aspen. Where I live now, I've been using aspen. And you told me once um, that you had fired with sagebrush. Sagebrush. And that you got a you got a really hot fire. So one time at Kelly Place, Leander and I, I did an experimental firing. I made a little corrugated block and I fired it with a I think juniper there, or whatever wood we had, and it came out pink, and I was like super upset with it. He was, and he's like, I'm gonna do this different. And I remember me throwing wood off the cliff, <laughs> <When I'm laughs> throwing pinion pine and, and sagebrush off the cliff, and I, I fired it, and it came out brilliant, brilliant white. So yeah. you can you can change it. How about that time? Oh, years ago, how 30 years or more? Well, yeah, it was in the early 90s. Early 90s. So, Rod Dobson, a friend of mine, he uh, came down to my house. It was in the middle of the winter. There was two foot of snow on the ground. He wants to fire some balls. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, we could go up on the mason and maybe we could find a big sheet of slick rock up there and we could fire on it. So, I had had a, a little black mesa, you probably all seen it big long bird pot. Um, I had that and I had it painted. <laughs> we went up on the mesa and we found a big big sheet of uh, slick rock, no snow on it. We did a pre-fire and tested it. And we loaded our pots in there and this was a surface fire. It wasn't a trench or nothing. Uh, we built our big fire up over it. It took a while to get going because the wood was wet. And it started really roaring, and we we're sitting over on a tree. And I hear this <laughs> boom! And I remember me seeing that bird pot flying in the air. <laughs> it was red hot, and it landed on the ground. And I ran over there with a stick, and I picked it up, threw it back in the coals. But it bounced like three times. <laughs> Rodney's pots all just jumped up, and went back down. <laughs> we didn't lose anything. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> wow. It rolled right out of the fire. Ping, ping, ping. Oh, yeah. And he ran over there as quick as he could. He got that stick and put it back in the fire. And he jumped back up. No crack. What a world of basement. Yeah. yeah. And, and that was a that was a bee plant. And it was an yeah. open fire. It was a beautiful pot. And the rock had spalled. The rock. Had the the rock spalled. <laughs> Six oh, inches oh, oh. for about. Eight foot circle, it was all tipped up. <laughs> Must have been a, a seam and moisture got in there and converted this. Oh, thing. You heard that this ripping sound, and then just a boom. <laughs> Any other questions? I have one. Janet? This is uh, Janet answering or asking a question. And I, I'm a high fire potter. Some of the people you referred to, Leander, were my mentors and teachers and friends. <coughs> and uh, I'm kind of getting the feeling that both of you are pyromaniacs as well <laughs> as clay artisans. Is this true? You should have seen some of the fires we had in the Camel Canyon. Taller, flame taller than the sea. <laughs> Do you suppose, well, actually this is a, a lead in to another question. Why, did no, why didn't the prehistoric potters develop more sophisticated kilns? In other words, they had incredible architecture, and ceramic kilns are architectural because they, they were designed to manage fire, air, fuel. Why did they never develop that? What do you, what do you think? Fire in the Kiva would have had a chimney exit or smoke exit. That's well, a that's a big kiln. 
<laughs> right. But, <laughs> Have you ever wondered about this? I think it worked well enough yeah. for what they had. What they had. I, that was my first thought, too. Exactly. And I think, I think that we got to revert back to uh, the way we were taught, like using lots of water to make a pot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think they ever, ever been, uh, introduced to that, so they just had to... Somebody didn't come over my boat. Yeah, so we, we, said, we have this. Hey guys. <laughs> we have this thing that we know how kilns work. They didn't know how kilns work, so I think that they they used their best knowledge. They probably were surface firing from the beginning, and then the, the trench fire became a, a later event. And one of the one of the things yes, they did. about pottery is that. It's fragile, and if it breaks, there's a chance to make more pottery. So if you make things that are too um, sturdy, you won't have a job. Videos African potters where they're talking about they were offered here's like a high fire, and they didn't want that because it was low fire. Pottery broke less when you cook them over flame. Yes. So there is specifically reason to go so, Yeah, I did an experiment about a year ago. Actually, a friend of mine did it. He was on a 30 day survival. So he, he was just living across the creek from his house. He cut all the metal buttons off his shirt, and zippers out, so he didn't want to have anything. It was modern, but I, I gave him a pretty big tall corrugated pot. There's a gentleman here that ended up giving it to roll up my like thing. Anyway, it sat on a fire for a month straight. I think we figured it out it was over 700 hours. So it was never really allowed to be completely cool. It was either leaching acorns or cooking stew or something. It was always being used. and. Uh, it didn't succumb to a fatality until like the last couple days. Uh, we had like an unusual windstorm that came up about 45, 50 miles an hour. And he had a oak log against it. And it really fanned it and got a blow, like a blowtorch on the side. And it put a crack about that long down on the rim. But it was still usable. Um, you could have just drilled two holes and repaired it. But he used it for another several days. I think a hard-fired pot <clears throat> wouldn't be able to stand that. That it's, it'd be too brittle. Uh, a softer fired pot can handle that heat. When I do cooking, and, and here's an interesting thing. And I'd like somebody to kind of look at this for. Um, this is probably experimental archaeology. So when I do corrugated pots, I always. They do not come out black. They come out a nice white color. And this was surface fire, by the way. Um, I cook in them. And if you look at the bottom of this pot, I'll pass it around. Be very careful with this pot. This is special. It has three white marks right there. So this is where it's set on three stones. And I built the fire around it. Um, as long as you have about two thirds full of moisture in it, you can cook in them forever. I think. I've seen people that I, I work for an outdoor survival company sometimes, and they've made cooking pots and things like that. And they've had them on the trail for several years, cooking them. And basically, all that happens is the rim gets chipped and broken, but the pot remains pretty intact, and they still use it. I'll pass this around. Be very careful. It's a very thin pot. It's a beautiful this is, piece. This is not a typical corrugated. This is extremely fine, very, very small coils. This is not the norm. There is some like this out there. This is the norm. But it takes a master to do this. Um, any other questions? Like, we probably have time for one or two more questions. Roy Vaughn? Uh, John gave me that. This is played prominently in my room. I've seen it. I've seen it. It's really special. Bob. Yeah, my name is Bob Casillas. Um, 
have a, a question for Leander on, on the death of the trees. Because you know, we fired one time in, in this agency that almost arrested <laughs> uh, and it was a it was a kill on Woods Mesa that we Woods Canyon that we excavated, and this thing was massive. I mean, it was about 18 feet long and it was about five feet wide, and it had a step in it, right? And so there was a, a shallower portion and then a, a deeper portion. And I've always suspected that maybe that deeper portion was for large vessels, but I, I just wanted to ask you guys what you think about. The importance of the depth of a, of a trench in terms of getting to so, good life. The depth doesn't bother me as much as when you're stacking the pottery out where, where it sits in that depth. If it sits down in the really deep, you're going to get dark pottery. You're going to get gray and blacks and you're not going to like it. So if you bring it up, it um, helps it. Interesting thing about what you're talking about, that loose depth. I have a good friend that we fire together a lot. Her name's Kelly. Um, at Rabbit Stick, which is a primitive gathering we were just at last week, every once in a while people want to do some red wear stuff. So like, we have to use the same kiln. So what we end up doing is in the deeper section, we put all our black and white stuff. And in the upper section, we put our red wares. But as far as the size of the kiln, the first uh, firing I did in Idaho, probably in nine, early, early 90s, um, I used a trench count kiln for me to you long. Three feet wide, but that long. 120 pots. That's for the kids to jump on. Get every one mate. John would like to hold her hand. Well, how are we doing on time? We used about. Uh, Ten minutes. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Shirley. Of course, I have a technical question. Uh, we've always wondered, not just me, uh, there's a couple of us, that when you know when you break, uh, you find a shirt in the wild and you bust it, it can be a redware shirt, sometimes a black and white. you got that gray center. And there's always the real debate on whether that's carbon, carbon in the, in the, um, the raw clay, a carbonaceous type based clay. Is it absorbed carbon? Again, I'm not concerned where the carbon came from. Or is it a reduced atmosphere streak? Because definitely in the orange wares, occasionally red wares, you'll, see, you'll have a nice orange core that's bracketed where the oxidation. But there's other times, because sometimes you're like, am I looking for an orange clay or am I looking for a gray clay? And it's hard to identify that carbon core versus that reduced core. Is there anything anything you can feed me on that? Because, I mean, everybody we talk to, it's hard to... I, gosh, that's a, that's a strange one, because I did a bunch of uh, shirts that some uh, UNLV needed to use for their class because they were shut down with COVID and they couldn't go out and do a, a dig out in the field. So they, they made up these packets and uh, they wanted me to provide them with broken shirts that were stuff that I'd made. I had some that were red wear, that were like a paper thin red on the outside and black on the inside. And other ones that were orange all the way through. Yeah. Um, I ended up breaking a corrugated pot, I ended up making a bowl, and it, I couldn't break it. Yeah. So I dropped it from about this size. Yeah. And I dropped it on the ground and it just bounced. I did it three times. <laughs> that was it, fire to fire. Do you remember that? So I thought, well, it won't break, so I'm going to stick a rock down there. And then I dropped it. And it, it but it had a gray core in it. And that's not the norm for this number 10 clay that I use. So I think it could be in the firing. Every, every firing would be a little different. It was a super dark, dark paint, so possibly um, it could have got a lot of, absorbed a lot of carbon early on. And then flash that surface off and let them inside. Um, I think it, it boy, it's a, every one is different. One of the one of the things that uh, that I've done firing is to heat those pots up, uncovered by wood or anything, just with wood around the the vessels. They get very very black. 
especially with the carbonaceous clay. I don't do red clay. This is before you ever put on heat. Before this I put on like still warming and priming. Yeah, and I think it forces carbon into the clay. Exactly. John and I were talking about this earlier, and I think it helps the resilience of the pot when it becomes covered with wood and fired. And, um, and then, and I've ended up with, the, the only way you can tell is breaking the pot, as it, with a perfect black core, and then that oxidized gray on the outside. And the only thing I can think of is by heating that up, getting it black, black in the, in the early stages of the firing. And then once it once that, that fire dies down to where you can get close enough to put wood on, that all gets taken care of. I think there's some differences in some of the clays. Okay. So the clays that, that I use, most of them are uh, They're not the carbonaceous ones. Okay. So they're the marine clays. So they're from old oceans, 200 million years ago, and they're fairly pure, except for they have some salt and alcohol in them. I have used some some clay that there's there's actually coal nearby, and I, I'm pretty sure it's carbon, full of carbon, and probably haven't broken a pot because I don't hardly ever break them. Probably should look into it. My experimental phase in, in doing pottery ended 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> my, my quick follow up on that is uh, have you ever found, because you know there's that, that thing about you know carbonaceous material, you can often have a gray clay that will fire multiple. Have you ever uh, colored? It can be a white clay, it can be a buff clay, a gray clay, once you, you fire it in an ox, oxidizing atmosphere. Have you ever found a, a gray clay in this area that will fire a nice deep orange, red orange? Uh, I don't know what a month yeah, it would be. Yeah, I have. It is carbonaceous clay. So it's gray clay. So you, you fire know that, right where it's at, a recapture reservoir. But that's not a gray clay. It's black, but it's kind of gray. Oh, yeah. Well, we may just have to take a road trip. There is a black clay out okay. here. <laughs> Out here to recapture, and it's black, and there's coal seams all around it. Right. And that fire's white. Oh, it'll fire orange if you oxidize it. I've, I've made orange pots out of it, and I've made black. pearly white pots out the of it. The black band that's real waxy. Yeah. It fires orange. Okay. Rod Dodson. So, um, I wonder if John could tell us, and, and Leander might have his own experience with this too, but uh, he always talks about different clays and he's got them numbered, you know, and how you came to number these clays and, and who uh, who commissioned you to go out and find all the clays on the northern Arizona Strip. And it's for me. Yeah, it's for you, but oh. Leander also has got his clays and how he's come to just try trial and error. So you hear that you know, number 10, how many of you heard that thing go around? <laughs> number 10 clay, life. So that's my main go-to clay right now. Um, I did a survey for the BLM uh, Grand Canyon Parish on. And uh, I was, my whole job for the whole summer was to go across the Arizona Strip, basically Nevada to Lake Powell uh, and north into Utah a little bit, and, and find as many different clays as I could find. I ended up finding 46 or 45 or 46. So this number 10 happened to be the, 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 uh, the tenth clay I found. The interesting, I was talking about earlier about the pot that just went flat. Guess what number it was? 13. <laughs> Weird. It's, it's less than a mile away from number 10. <laughs> Leslie. Just a thought, coming back to uh, what Leander was saying about uh, starting, you know, the fire with the wood around it, and just and then doing the cripping on top of that. And that's answered one of the things that I've always kind of wondered about as we're loading these kilns after they've, you know, we've had the primary fire, we put in the the um, kiln furniture, and then 
you know, we're in there with welding gloves and facial shields and, you know, Bob's got his Nomex shirt off. <laughs> and, and they didn't have that kind of thing, you know? And so I'm like, how did they avoid, you know, and we've had, you know, every once in a while, hot blows up early. I mean, how many people were down there with their face in that heat? And how, how did they avoid getting burned? How did they avoid... Always. You're losing an eye or something like that when you're doing that. I think, yeah. I think Rodney and Jay can attest to that. I just get right in there. Just like this. <laughs> All the hair will burn off the arm. The salamander. <laughs> and I see John fired barefoot. And it's a safety officer. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he's just careful where he steps. <laughs> you know, I, would, I would like to say something. Before we close, or in closing, I think... Everybody here is, is pretty enamored with Mesa Verde. I am myself. I mean, it's beautiful stuff. But wherever you live, find what's there and deal with it. I, I live in, uh, well, I live in the Canta region, the Canta Potters now, but where I used to live was Virgin, Virgin Canta. Virgin is the far western branch of the Anasazi. Uh, corrugated pottery looks almost exactly like the Mesa Verde. But their, their black and whites are very different. Their orange wares are all traded in. Um, but they didn't use slips. And, and it's, it's just nice to, to, to create something from your area and replicate what's there. You don't always have to do this saggy orange ware or makes it very black and white or tularosa or whatever. It's fun to do that if, you know, when you explore outward. But I would just suggest people stick with where they live and replicate, try to replicate that. That's doing more good for the whole process. Like Andy is doing Salado stuff. That's where he lives. I just think it's a, you know, where I live, they don't slip anything. It's just the raw clay, it's basic clay. Janet. I have a question in all the years of observing looking at carefully prehistoric pottery, clay that it was made from, the geology that clay came from. Have you noted individual work? I'll go so far as to say geniuses prehistorically that, that made discoveries, that came up with innovations that we're you know, trying to replicate. How, what is your experience with that? Yep. So there's a there's a, a dwelling that was covered up by Lake Mead, and they have a museum down there called the Lost City Museum. There's a pot down there that has an extremely specific design in it. It's not something you could copy or, or remember and copy. It's very specific. I've seen that design in, in Lost, Lost City Museum. I've seen it in St. George. I've seen it in Cedar City. I've seen it in Canab, exact same design. Different clays, but the exact same, I mean exact. And it's, it's, not, a, it's not an easy design to do, I'd replicate it, but it's, you have to really concentrate. It's, it's a maze that goes back and forth all the way around. It's pretty incredible, but it's, I've, I've seen it broken shirts of it on Little Creek Mesa, which is, Right in the middle of the Virgin Minnesota. So I, I think we've run out of time. So I, for one, want to give them a standing ovation. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.